Bem-vindos a Brasília, a capital que, por meio de suas linhas modernistas, traçou o futuro de um país de dimensões continentais e enfrentou o grande desafio de integrar norte, sul, leste e oeste no desenho de uma sociedade mais justa, democrática e igualitária. Bem-vindos ao Brasil. Ficção científica do passado, capital das águas, quadradinho, avião, Reconhecida por vários nomes, esta cidade criada para ser a morada de uma burocracia que se alternava no tempo, um não lugar, cedeu aos afetos e se transformou em lá nas mãos de seus habitantes e nas gerações que ali se desenvolveram. Gostaríamos de tê-los aqui conosco, compartilhando das belezas de nosso céu, de nossas águas, de nossa cultura, de nossa gastronomia e de nossa gente. Porém, os desafios trazidos pelo momento crítico que o nosso planeta enfrenta nos impedem de vivenciar esses momentos com vocês. Mais de uma coisa podemos ter certeza. Se a pandemia de Covid-19 nos afasta fisicamente, ela também nos aproxima ao nos fazer relembrar de que os desafios que a humanidade enfrenta necessitam ser enfrentados conjuntamente, reconhecendo que todos nós compartilhamos de uma condição que nos faz humanos. Se por um lado não estamos juntos, por outro nunca estivemos mais próximos em nossas preocupações e necessidades. Vamos juntos avançar sobre os problemas globais que se impõem. Vamos juntos construir democracias melhores, mais transparentes, mais responsáveis e mais participativas. Sejam bem-vindos à Conferência Internacional de Comissários de Acesso à Informação 2021. Good afternoon and welcome to ICIC 2021 webinar on state secrecy. My name is Genevieve Lester. I am the Desario Chair of Strategic Intelligence at the U.S. Army War College and I'm the moderator of this panel this afternoon. I'm pleased now to introduce my colleagues on the panel beginning with Alastair Roberts, who is the director of the School of Public Policy at University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's written several books, among which are Four Crises of American Democracy, Can, America do, Can Government Do Anything Right? and Strategies for Governing. He received his law degree from the University of Toronto and his PhD in public policy from Harvard University. He is also a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Our next panelist is David Posen, who is the Vice Dean for Intellectual Life and the Charles Keller Beekman Professor of Law, uh, Yale Law School. Um, American Law Institute named Posen the recipient of its Early Career Scholars uh, Medal, and he's written widely on issues of um, of government, transparency, free speech. In 2017, Posen became the inaugural visiting scholar at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Um, among other interesting facets of his career, he was also special advisor to Harold Coe, legal advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Finally, our third panelist is Karina Furtado Rodriguez, who is professor at the Postgraduate Program in Military Science in Sciences in the Brazilian Army Command and General Staff College and Director of Communications and Publications at the Brazilian so uh, Society of Public Administration. She writes about access to information and state secrecy, civil military relations, public policy and governance in defense. She holds an MA and, and PhD in public administration from the Getulio Vargas Foundation and a BA in business administration from the Federal University of Ruiz de Fora. Welcome all. Thank you all for participating today. We will begin with a presentation from our colleague, uh, Dr. Roberts. All right. Well, thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with everyone today. I'm glad to be visiting Brazil, even if I'm only doing it through Zoom. And it's a pleasure to join my distinguished panelists as well. Um, I'd like to say just a few words about the question of transparency or openness in the security sector of government. And by the security of sector of government, I basically mean that part of government where where people have guns uh the military forces police services intelligence services and so on uh and uh i just want to say a few comments about thinking about the question of 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 how we achieve or how much uh transparency we should achieve in the security sector 
The traditional problem in the security sector, so far as transparency is concerned, is this tendency to think that there is something special about the sector. That is to say that the, the stakes, the national interest is so intense in this sector that there ought to be special rules for dealing with transparency. In particular, that the barriers to access of in, accessing information in the sector ought to be very high. So governments do many different things. Sometimes they say that institutions in the security sector will be excluded entirely from access laws. Uh, or they say that uh, officials operating in this sector may withhold information without undertaking the usual balancing of considerations for and against uh, disclosure of information. Um, or governments will limit the right of third parties, whether it's courts or ombudsmen or commissioners to review decisions by bureaucrats not to disclose. So in all of these ways, the security sector of government tends to be dealt with in a special way. Um, and I, the first argument I would like to make is that we want to resist, I think, this tendency to say that there is something special about the security sector. Uh, I would say transparency in the security sector is especially important because we are talking about people who have guns, uh, people who have uh, an enhanced capacity to take actions that could damage human rights. And precisely because human rights are in jeopardy, especially in this sector, accountability is especially important. And that's why we need to be meticulous about applying the usual balancing test, the weighing of arguments for and against transparency in this sector, and also in allowing um, third parties scrutiny of decisions to withhold information. So that's the, the first big point that I would like to make. And then I think I'd just like to make a, a second point. And, and that is that there are other problems relating to the security sector of government that are uh, growing over time um, and uh, that we have to think about as well. Uh, there are three tendencies operating in the security sector of most governments today. Uh, the first is a, a rapid uh, um, rate of technological advance in the sector. Um, security institutions tend to be early adopters of advanced technologies, whether it's technologies for surveillance and communications uh, and so on. So we have a phenomenon of technological improvement in this sector. Uh, we also have a growing practice of information sharing between governments, whether it's between governments within one country or between countries. Um, and because we have more information sharing, we have more intergovernmental agreements that impose constraints on what can be done with shared information. So increasingly we see within the security sector a pooling of information among multiple governments. And we also see in some places state agencies relying more intensely on corporate partners, on businesses um, for their activities in terms of um, collecting and interpreting information. Uh, very often uh, security uh, agencies end up using proprietary technologies to do their work uh, for the purposes of surveillance and control. So we have three factors, uh, technological change, uh, information sharing, and integration with the private sector. And these three factors, I think, make it increasingly hard for um, uh, civil society organizations, watchdog organizations, not only to access information, but to understand that the, what is going on inside the security sector. Um, it may be hard to access information because other entities may also try to impose barriers to disclosure. For example, a government that has shared information may insist that the information cannot be disclosed within a jurisdiction, uh, or a business may say that there are uh, restrictions on what can be done with the information it has provided to government or the technologies that it has provided to government. Uh, another predicament that 
follows on this is, is the question of um, making sense of what's going on inside the security sector, even if transparency is achieved. For example, we might imagine a scenario where information is released to a watchdog or civil society organization, but there's so much information that it's uh, impossible for that external organization to make sense of it all. Uh, or it might be that the information is in such a form that it would be incomprehensible to any external actor that doesn't have the right training and the right kind of equipment. So the predicament that we are facing is not just a problem of access to information, it's a problem of the capacity of civil society organizations and watchdog organizations to actually interpret the information and hold or organizations in the security sector accountable. And just to wrap up, I wanna show, I'm gonna share just one slide uh, for a moment to sort of illustrate um, the predicament I'm talking about. Um, somebody give me a thumbs up if you're actually seeing the picture right now. Uh, Genevieve, yeah, good. So these are two pictures that I took of uh, about 20 years ago, and they are pictures of the Stasi archives uh, in Berlin. The Stasi was the secret police of the uh, East German uh, government. Uh, obviously the Stasi uh, ended their work uh, when the East, Germany, East German regime collapsed, uh, I believe in 1991. Um, you know, in the final days of East Germany, there were worries within the secret police headquarters that citizens would seize the building um, and seize these records that you're seeing in these pictures um, and discover what the secret police, the bureaucracy had been doing. Um, and as you look at these pictures, you can see the information was held in documents contained in manila folders and in index cards kept in these machines and in microfiche as well. And we, when we look at that, we think, well, you know, this is uh, a relic of another age. This is one of the last great surveillance systems of the pre-digital age. And it actually was conceivable that individuals, citizens could storm and occupy the building and start reading the records and understand what the Stasi was doing. The predicament in the modern age is that even if citizens seize the building, to use a metaphor, uh, they wouldn't be able to interpret the records, the information that's held within the building for all of the reasons that I've mentioned earlier on. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to make these uh, opening comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Um, very insightful comments. I'd like to move on to our next panelist. Um, David Posen, please. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm honored to be here. And um, like Professor Roberts, I'm gonna focus my remarks on the security sector uh, and national security secrecy. And uh, with apologies for the parochialism of it, discuss the US experience with managing national security secrecy and the problem of overclassification. And I'm just gonna walk briefly through uh, the nature of the problem and attempts that have been made and largely failed uh, to manage overclassification of national security secrets in the US with some suggestions about what lessons we might take away from it. Um, so the US system for managing national security information really arose during the Cold War. It was President Truman in 1951 who first formalized a classification system for managing national security secrets. Um, and it has grown enormously since then. Uh, one scholar estimates that from 1978 to 2004, over 8 billion pages were classified and withheld from the public uh, in this national security system. Uh, another scholar estimates that we've now crossed the 1 trillion page mark in the number of documents classified here. Um, Commentators from across the political spectrum and many high-level government commissions have all concluded that the US classification system is out of control and staggeringly large. Uh, why has it grown so big? That's a big uh, complicated story wrapped up in both US uh, domestic politics and geopolitics of the Cold War. Uh, but 
there has been a um, gain in power and resources for the national security agencies um, since the middle of the 20th century here uh, and a surrounding culture of secrecy that's grown up uh, in, in their work. Um, the classification system is managed entirely by the executive branch. Uh, it's not governed by any framework statute from Congress. Uh, and as I'll, I'll explain in a moment, has received only modest scrutiny from the courts. Um, individual actors within the executive branch uh, have a kind of lack of incentives to refrain from overclassifying documents. They have a lot to lose from letting out secrets that shouldn't get out and little to gain um, from the opposite. Um, and uh, they face little resistance from external checks. Um, so what are the big efforts that have been made in the United States to manage the secrecy system more rationally and reduce the number of uh, documents that are unnecessarily classified? Um, uh, I, I see a few efforts as the most significant, uh, and I'll uh, suggest that they, they have not succeeded. So in terms of the courts uh, engaging uh, and checking over classification. Probably the most significant thing that happened was in 1974, the US Congress amended our Freedom of Information Act to clarify that exemption one for national security secrets um, should be vigorously policed uh, by the courts. In particular, Congress instructed that um, courts should review de novo, that is giving no deference to the executive branch uh, agencies claims of exemption one. So Congress made it crystal clear that if the executive branch says we're withholding some documents because they raised national security secrets, Congress instructed the courts to get in there, uh, look at the documents and make a determination for themselves about whether they are in fact properly classified. Um, this is not what's happened. Um, in the vast majority of exemption one cases, uh, the courts grant the executive branch summary judgment without even inspecting the records, uh, making it virtually impossible for litigants to counter the claims of the agencies that these documents are properly classified and should be withheld. Um, the, the win rate for plaintiffs challenging Exemption 1 claims uh, is well under 3%. Most studies have concluded. Um, the New York Times top lawyer wrote in a recent article that victories in Exemption 1 cases in FOIA litigation are legal unicorns um, almost never happen. Uh, so it turns out that notwithstanding Congress's uh, telling the courts uh, to offer much more robust scrutiny of exemption one claims, uh, there is little judicial appetite for doing so. Um, I see the move by Congress in 1974 to try to get the courts to be the enforcers uh, of uh, limits on classification as a, in hindsight, a kind of fatal error. Because at that time, in the wake of the Vietnam War and scandals surrounding the Nixon presidency, Congress was more emboldened than ever before or since um, to check the national security state and passed a number of framework statutes overriding presidential vetoes. Um, Congress actually considered in the early 1970s legislating a national security classification system whereby Congress would create the rules for what can be classified pursuant to what procedures and safeguards, and Congress would oversee that system. Uh, that proposal failed, and ultimately what was passed in its stead was this reform to the Freedom of Information Act, telling courts to do de novo review of Exemption 1 claims. So instead of Congress uh, putting itself in the driver's seat in overseeing the classif classification system, uh, it turned to the courts, who, um, for various reasons we can get into if people would like, um, it turns out do not actually want to push back on executive branch national security secrecy claims. Um, so the, uh, within Congress, there were other efforts taken to um, uh, empower oversight over national security secrecy around the same time that also have, have had a dismal track record. For example, uh, in 1976, the Intelligence Committee of the U.S. Senate which oversees the, uh, the intelligence community of the executive branch, um, passed a rule for its own committee that uh, is, remains pretty obscure in US legal and political circles. But the rule says that the Senate Intelligence Committee can vote to disclose to the public uh, 
documents that it believes the executive branch has improperly classified. Um, if the, the president is given an opportunity to object, if the president objects, then the matter goes to the full Senate uh, and a majority vote overrides the president on that, on that issue. And the House Intelligence Committee adopted a similar provision around the same time. Those provisions have almost never been used. Um, I've had, I've had uh, student researchers look into it. We can barely find any examples in which uh, they've ever been used. So it turns out that the intelligence oversight committees don't want to be doing declassification uh, themselves. Uh, there is a provision in the US Constitution called the speech or debate clause that goes further and says that any individual member of Congress on the floor of Congress can say anything, including revealing uh, classified information in the interest of democratic deliberation and not face criminal or civil sanction. You are immunized as a member of Congress from legal punishment for disclosing information uh, in the course of your duties. Um, uh, after a very limited use of that provision around national security issues um, having to do with the Vietnam War, that clause has likewise almost never been used by members of Congress uh, in, in the decades since. Um, so neither branch, uh, uh, neither the courts nor Congress, it turns out, uh, is very motivated to, um, to push back on excessive national security secrecy. If that's the, the failure side of the story, um, I think there have been limited and complicated successes that I'll just highlight briefly um, that have made a dent. So within the executive branch, I think one promising reform that has happened is the uh, establishment of what's called the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel. I know it's a mouthful, the acronym is ISCAP. Um, this is a body uh, uh, composed of executive branch officials. So not judges, not members of Congress, it's executive branch officials with national security expertise. Members of the public can go to this panel and claim that documents are being improperly classified, ought to be declassified. And uh, much to the surprise of many observers, the track record has been very good for people making those claims to ISCAP. In fact, ISCAP has voted more often than not to declassified records uh, that have been brought to its attention. Um, so within the executive branch, it's only reached a small number of cases. It's a very limited reform at this point, uh, but it seems that executive branch officials, when forced to directly confront claims of overclassification, uh, are actually more willing to recognize uh, errors and excesses uh, than perhaps less national security informed officials from the other branches. Um, and second, the other um, way in which overclassification has been managed and to some extent mitigated in this country has been leaking. Uh, that is, uh, with or without uh, approval from higher level officials, executive branch employees going to the media and sharing uh, details of activities that are happening, whether because they wanna promote them and celebrate them or because they wanna criticize them uh, and flag uh, potential legal or other problems. Um, there is um, a massive amount of leaking to the media of national security secrets that happens uh, uh, in the United States and very low rate of criminal prosecution or administrative penalty uh, for leakers. Uh, partly this is a function of legal doctrines here that protect members of the media uh, and allow them to publish uh, what, basically whatever they can collect. Um, and partly it's a function of executive branch self-restraint uh, in, in not going after potential leakers uh, as vigorously uh, as it might. Um, and so we've, we've worked our way to a point where um, instead of one equilibrium where we have a narrow formal classification system and people learn through the uh, routine channels of disclosure and declassification, um, we have, we've really gone to another equilibrium where we have a massively bloated overclassification problem uh, and then informal disclosure that, um, uh, that cuts away at its edges. Um, I'm not sure anyone would think that massive over, overclassification plus massive leaking is a first best solution uh, to problems of national security secrecy, uh, but it's the second best um, uh, equilibrium we, we, we've groped our way towards. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, one of the reasons that we've, we've had such a, a stable problem of overclassification and there hasn't been more of a, a momentum to reform it uh, is that leaking has emerged um, as a kind of backstop. Um, so uh, I guess I'll close by saying, I think ideally one would have more robust oversight of national security secrecy 
um, by the Congress and the courts um, and by auditors or inspectors general within the executive branch. Uh, in the absence of that, uh, the US case perhaps suggests that it, you can at least have robust protections for media freedom um, to uh, compensate for some of the deficits uh, in the other branches where they exist. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Posen. We'll reach out to our final panelist, Professor Karina Furtado Rodriguez. Thank you, Genevieve. Good, after, good afternoon. It's an honor to be a part of this webinar. My take on secrecy will be more focused on the security sector of Latin America and, Bra and Brazil. But first, I have a disclaimer to make. Uh, the analysis and the opinions I bring to this debate are my own and do not necessarily represent the position of the Brazilian army or government. Now let's get started. Democracies, they need secrecy, but not just any kind. We need good secrecy, especially in defense and intelligence. We need a kind of secrecy that comes from transparent and accountable classification processes with third parties able to assess trustworthiness and democratic legitimacy. The main challenge for Latin American countries is that secrecy legitimacy is not usually based on democratic values, but on technocracy. Brazilian literature on bureaucracy uses the term insulamento burocratico or bureaucratic isolation to describe the need for governments to have specialized agencies that are somehow protected from politics. Implementing this isolation with a strong and specialized bureaucracy was one of the first steps towards policy stability in Brazil in the mid thirties, when patronage used to be the only norm. Because of that, we can infer that isolation is not a bad, bad thing in itself. Nonetheless, when we talk about institutions that hold the monopoly on violence or institutions that can have access to your personal information, checks and balances are even more important. In this regard, it's impossible to discuss the legitimacy of defense secrecy without mentioning civil military relations. Latin America is far from what, what authors like Jonovitz, Moscos, and Caforio advocated decades ago in terms of civilianization of security and defense affairs. And we are also very distant from Huntington's claim that objective control, which is the respect for professionalization, plus subjective control, which are institutional and legal restrictions to autonomy, would translate into civilian control. What are, why are we so far from this model? Simply because too much bureaucratic isolation often translates into loose subjective control. Having said that, we are talking about relatively well-developed democracies. Aren't they pluralist enough? As a great Brazilian political scientist, José Murilo de Carvalho says in one of his books about the armed forces in Brazil, regarding defense in the country's constitutional assembly of 1988, the left wing was omissive and the right wing was complicit. Military bureaucrats themselves wrote most of the pieces of our constitution that established the legal foundation stones for Brazil's defense. Defense was a military reserve domain, which is an expression used by Narcisse Serra, former Ministry of Defense of Spain, in one of his books. Things have not drastically changed since then. In 2012, when I started studying civil military relations during my master's degree, the usual reaction when I mentioned the topic was disbelief. Most people thought it was an insignificant matter. I even heard that the only interesting thing about studying the military was to know how to better employ them in internal humanitarian missions, such as bringing water to the northeast of the country where there is drought. As the literature on civilian knowledge of defense has already debated, and probably also because of our history of authoritarian regimes, Latin America's civil society still holds a great amount of prejudice against defense as a topic to be studied within public policy. But I'm not talking about civil society in general, 
I'm talking about civilians with power to influence the policy agenda, elected officials, non-military bureaucrats, the media, and academia in general. The question I keep asking to myself is, how can one be a good defense policy analyst without knowing anything about the topic? More specific to our discussion, how should we evaluate the accuracy of secrecy in a defense acquisition process, for example, if we don't know anything about defense or about the history of war or the impact of certain technologies on deterrence or even the meaning of the word deterrence? Obviously, these topics will hardly receive the same attention in Latin America as in countries that are at war, such as the United States. In many countries of our region, the military are deployed mostly internal missions, mainly public security ones. However, countries that want to exert strategic self-determination, even when making allies, need to somehow preserve and nurture such defense knowledge among civilians. We know that misjudgment of the importance of defense affairs has led many civilians to think defense as a military thing, which is wrong. Defense is bigger than military and so are its secrets. Thus, if we think about the management of state secrecy as a service to society, a part of a public good that needs to be efficient within the boundaries of democracy and integrity, we should talk about redesigning classification systems in such a fashion so they can First, prevent classification flaws, whether due to overclassifying or underclassifying records. Besides being a way to hide illegal behavior, overclassification also entails a costly bureaucratic burden on public administration. Underclassification, on the other hand, can risk exposing sensitive information and in and of itself demonstrates inefficacy, which undermines deterrence. Second, make sure public military official, officials are well trained and have clear standards for establishing in which secrecy tired, tired the records should be classified. That is to say, ensure adequate risk assessment. Third, provide de facto transparency after declassification, which relies on adequate management of archives that will safe keep these documents for decades and guarantee full disclosure of the content of, of declassified records with no omitted parts. Fourth, operate with a clear understanding of the boundaries between classification and personal data protection. It should be clear that public officials' actions while exercising the authority derived from their public position will necessarily generate public records, which are not subject to personal data protection restrictions. Fifth, have external control institutions to ensure accountability of these processes with personnel equipped with knowledge to understand what defense, intelligence, and classification really mean. This list is not exhaustive, and each country and region will have their specificities. However, balance and agreement between those who produce secrecy and those who ask for information is still a challenge. On the one hand, bureaucrats in general are, are suspicious of citizens' intentions when making information and declassification requests. More often than we would like, information is difficult to find even for experienced bureaucrats. Excessive red tape is a characteristic of Latin American bureaucracies we may not forget. There is no evidence that this reality is going to change in the near future. And within the bureaucrat bureaucratic panacea, it may be hard to share even unclassified information within and among military institutions. On the one hand, on the other hand, civilians often fail to understand that some information will not be, uh, be made available to the public while the object of the request is in use by defense institutions. An example of that are the floor pl plans of defense buildings. Some information, even when not in use anymore, such as previous encryption techniques, can partially reveal current techniques if they are an evolution of the pre previous ones. To better regulate and control cases such as the ones I just mentioned, 
regulators need to understand the functioning of these institutions. Interestingly, and at least in Brazil, the military themselves, together with the Ministry of Education, have been implementing an induction policy with the aim of increasing the number of experts in defense for more than a decade. This policy's objective is to expand postgraduate programs, research grants, and fellowships focused on defense affairs. I am a result of this policy, by the way. We now have a considerably wide academic community studying the topic, who hopefully will be able to develop the still absent pluralism in the way of thinking defense and consequently promoting changes in transparency and classification systems. The question that remains is, will there be seats at the table for these experts? Without civilian ministries of defense and civilian careers in such ministries and single forces, and without independent defense think tanks, isolation will continue to triumph and new approaches to classification systems will be merely formal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your great contributions to the conversation. We have a series of questions that have popped up from our organizers and also from some, um, some audience members. And I'm going to start with a very broad conceptual question that I will throw out to the group. And then I hope we can have a relatively informal conversation around this. And that is, does the information classification system impose obstacles to democracy promotion? As a second part of this question, to what extent does state secrecy impact accountability? Very broad. I hope one of you can just jump in on this one. Al, would you like to start? Uh, well, um, I'm not quite sure how to approach the, the question. Uh, state, state secrecy is a necessity, but also a problem. Let's concede that agencies in the security sector of government need to preserve secrets for some purposes in order to accomplish legitimate national interests. Uh, but excessive secrecy is uh, dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous for the sort of prosaic reasons that bureaucrats being bureaucrats may sometimes uh, spend too much money or manage their activities uh, imprudently. Um, there is also the other consideration that bureaucrats are engaged in the making of public policy. Uh, they're formulating policies. In a democracy, we're supposed to have public input in the crafting of key public policies. And it's impossible for the public to participate in a meaningful way in making public policy unless they have access to certain kinds of information about how a policy is likely to work. And then the third consideration, which is peculiar to the security sector, is that um, these are agencies that have the capacity to do good, but also to do serious harm. Um, and uh, harm to individuals, both inside the country and outside. Um, and it's necessary to assure proper accountability for these organizations so that human rights are protected. So those are the sort of range of considerations why we need to make sure that there is a balancing of the considerations that justify secrecy and the considerations that justify transparency and a balancing that is done by some independent third party uh, that has the uh, capacity to see the information and, and make the right calculation. Thank you so much, I Sorry for putting you on the spot there. Oh, no, no worries. I, uh, I might just add briefly that I, mean, I agree with everything Professor Roberts said that um, I, th I think the secrecy norms and rules for the security sector also inevitably spill over into other sectors. Um, what I have in mind is um, in, the, in countries like the United States where it's very hard to get access to national security information, um, the freedom of information laws make it relatively easy to get information from the non-national security parts of government. So the domestic regulatory agencies that look at public health, civil rights, and the like, they are overwhelmed by Freedom of Information Act requests, congressional demands for information, and the like. And they are constantly generating uh, uh, scrutiny. Um, and 
whereas the national security agencies are largely insulated from those same mechanisms uh, due to their exemptions and special secrecy rules. Um, actually, by the same token, powerful private companies are, are excluded from our main freedom of information laws. Um, the, the, they're just outside of the, uh, the scope of the Freedom of Information Act. So there has been um, a documented evolution in uh, investigative journalism in the United States toward the domestic regulatory agencies, um, where they are constantly subject to exposés, uh, criticisms, and takedowns for their alleged uh, bad behavior or, or, or bloated spending or the like. Um, where, it, it, but by contrast, uh, the national security state and powerful private sector actors um, aren't subject to that that same kind of um, that same kind of oversight from from civil society and the media. Um, so the problem, I, I would just to put it in a slightly larger context, isn't only insufficient access to national security information, it's that um, uh, all of the resources uh, uh, of the media and civil society to figure out and um, attack uh, what government is doing um, get channeled to other parts of government uh, in a way that if you want kind of robust um, government intervention in the economy, uh, public health and the like, uh, and you worry about uh, the violent components of the state, um, might look exactly backwards to you. Thank you. Professor Rodriguez, did you want to add anything to that? Yes. Um, well, at least in Brazil, we have an absence of sanctions. When a governmental institution uh, is not complying with our norms of, uh, uh, or with our classification system. So I think this is a problem. Uh, Politicians are not really interested also in knowing secret, uh, the national defense secrets. So it gets even harder for us to have a really democratic uh, classification system. Uh, and our watchdog institutions, they, they have, uh, they, they really have uh, some, specific, speci uh, some specific knowledge uh, on defense. But they have uh, to, to audit so many institutions that it's really hard for them to really focus on national security secrecies. Only that. I know that uh, the Federal Court of Auditors, uh, they have a sector specialized in defense and they have evaluated with full disclosure all our strategic projects. Uh, so I think this is a really positive uh, sign uh, of an, an institutionalization of a dem really democratic uh, classification system, but uh, they, they can do it all. So our civil society, by not knowing about defense, uh, this is not really a, a topic that we discuss, we are not in, uh, at war. So I think it, it makes things harder. Thank you very much. Very interesting points. I'm going to provide a question from the audience for our panel. So please bear with me as I read this. This is also conceptual and a little bit lengthy. How should guarantor bodies deal with the tension between access to public information and state secrets? How must they combine these two concepts in such a way that the social benefit is maximized? I see this question is, is also pulling some of the threads in the three different presentations. Who wants to jump in on this one? Well, all right, maybe I'll bite and just uh, say that, um, uh, again, drawing on the US example, it, it seems to me that there's been um, a rough consensus on the criteria for withholding information for, for quite a while. Uh, and and, I, and from what I know of other countries, there's been some convergence around these criteria too, um, uh, which include you know, that there has to be a demonstrated harm or threat to national security to justify withholding, um, and at least the potential for some balancing of that national security risk against uh, legal and democratic considerations. Um, uh, I'm not sure that we're gonna make great progress in refining the standards that govern when information is to be released. Um, I think it's it's actually um, more in the, the details of how they're operationalized and overseen that where, where the problems arise. So um, in principle, everyone seems to agree that 
uh, sufficient risk to national security can justify withholding. But what exactly is national security? And it turns out the executive branch of the United States has defined that concept increasingly elastically over time to include not just you know, physical threats uh, to the homeland, uh, but also all, all kinds of uh, potential um, compromising of government functions. So there's um, a question about what exactly constitutes national security. Um, and also what, what exactly is the showing of risk that needs to be made? Um, what kind of likelihood of um, problems from the disclosure has to be shown and, and what kind of magnitude um, of harm? Uh, that, that has kind of resisted specification and um, courts have not demanded any kind of uh, robust showing of likelihood of harm in the US for disclosure. So I, I wouldn't uh, try to change the standard so much as ask for a better case to be made um, in any given withholding dispute um, over the actual likelihood of harm. Um, and then finally, I would just say um, in those areas where uh, withholding from the public is appropriate, because I agree with the other commentators that sometimes it, it must be, it must happen. Um, I think the principle that should govern is that there shouldn't be secrets that are just confined to one arm of government. Um, but there should always be some kind of intra-governmental review, whether it's from within the executive branch, ideally also uh, from the legislative branch uh, as well. Um, there is a big space between full public disclosure and total uh, confinement to one part of the executive branch. Um, and there's a lot of uh, democratic um, and policy good that could be done uh, by making those secrets that don't reach the public at least subject to internal, uh, in, internal scrutiny. Um, so I, I would approach the problem that way um, rather than try to tweak uh, the standards for withholding, uh, which, which seem to me um, uh, largely similar across the world and, and, and not the cause of the uh, overclassification problem. Well, that's fascinating. I think it's also a really great point you raised that the, the, what constitutes a threat is expanding. So we see the Pentagon intelligence community engaging with things like climate change and these types of issues. So where do we draw the limits of what actually constitutes a national security threat? Because it's expanding. I think that's an excellent point. Great approach to this. Anyone else want to jump in on this? If I could just pick up on that. I agree it is very difficult to develop a precise formula about when information should be withheld or disclosed. You can identify the relevant factors that might be applied to a case, but of course, you're also going to be looking at circumstances. You know, what you thought was a reasonable disclosure decision five years ago might not be the, a reasonable disclosure decision today with regard to the same kind of information, just because circumstances change. But I want to add one complicating factor. Very often when we think about transparency, we are assuming a simple world in which there is an agency, a bureaucracy, that has the discretion to decide whether it is going to withhold information or release information. And then we assume that there is maybe some kind of watchdog organization that has the discretion to decide whether the bureaucracy made the judgment correctly. And we're imagining a sort of a country or an agency that is on its own and has the independence to make that decision. Uh, the complicating factor I want to emphasize is that we don't live in that kind of world anymore. Um, the agency very often is not acting on information that it acquired by itself. It's acting on information that it received from another organization. Uh, uh, some uh, might be another organization in government. It might be a government in a different country. So every agency is using a, a pool or stockpile of information that comes from many different places. And when the agency acquires this information from other agencies, it makes agreements with these other agencies about what it will do with the information. And usually the agreement is that it will never disclose the shared information without the consent of the, the government that gave the information, uh, originator control of the information. So the agency has surrendered its discretion to make a decision about whether it will release the information. And similarly, the watchdog, the referee, the umpire 
is also constrained in the ability to override the agency's decision. The decision about whether information would be disclosed was made at a much earlier stage when the agency signed the agreement relating to information sharing. You can think about this relating to other governments, but also with regard to business partners as well. So um, we want to know about the information sharing regime. Uh, we don't wanna just focus on specific decisions about the disclosure of information. We want also to know what are agencies agreeing to when they, when they sign these agreements on information sharing? Because that constitutes part of the sort of informal law of access to information. So one of the things we want watchdog organizations to do and civil society organizations to do is not just monitor specific disclosure decisions, but also monitor what agencies are doing or, or agreeing to in these information sharing arrangements. Thank you. Professor Rodriguez, did you want to add? Yes. Uh, there are uh, some mechanisms that uh, already work well in developed countries that, uh, for example, in, in Latin America, we, we might use them uh, better uh, in order to promote this balance between uh, secrecy and the benefits of, of secrecy. For example, we, in many countries, uh, the, transparent, the transparency of budgets is really, really low. And it's a, a really basic feature to know uh, a country's budget on defense and intelligence. And we are not talking about uh, uh, two, uh, uh, specificities of, of the budget that could harm intelligence, but there are budgets that are, ex, uh, that are classified ex ante. Um, so these mechanisms, they could enhance uh, uh, this evaluation about the benefits of classification because in the way they are in Latin America right now, few, really few countries uh, have this better transparent, uh, transparency in budgetary issues. So an eternal secrecy, uh, at least for uh, national documents that, that, are not, that didn't come from other countries, uh, should not exist. Uh, society should be able to have access to them one day. And we know that, for example, Mexico, uh, the national security law, overrides the freedom of information um, law. So we have all these uh, institutional improvements that we can still make uh, that would uh, give better answers to this question. Oh, thank you, that's an excellent answer. Um, I wanna pull a thread that David brought up about leaking and the role of leaking and as to press the point whistleblowing and its relationship to secrecy. Do individuals have a moral responsibility to leak or to be whistleblowers when they see transgressions in the security space? What do you think? I'll go, I'll go. Uh, yes, in some instances. Um, and there should be laws that uh, allow for uh, uh, protected uh, disclosures uh, in, in, in specified circumstances. Um, the, uh, the, the question of, and this is not, I want to emphasize my main area, but you want to have a regime, um, a legal system that allows individuals under specified circumstances to make disclosures if they see, for example, human rights abuses or some other sort of uh, misbehavior. Uh, and of course, that law uh, would also, um, might also say, how these disclosures ought to be made as well. Thank you. I, I might just, uh, I, I agree with everything Professor Roberts said um, and note that um, I might have added to my catalog of, of failures in the US uh, ongoing saga of attempts to rein in overclassification uh, whistleblower protection statutes. So there has been a pro proliferation of whistleblower protection laws in this country since the 1970s but uh, much less so in the national security space. And study after study has found uh, 
that the whistleblower laws are not as effective in the security sector um, for various reasons. You, they, they all say that you have to go first to your own agency with your concerns and then potentially to a, a relevant congressional oversight body. Um, a lot of national security employees feel that that's a sure recipe to um, get in trouble, you know, if they if they take their concerns uh, it, to those internal um, uh, bodies. Um, you're never allowed to go to the media uh, with your um, concerns of your national security uh, employee. So um, I think there's a lot we could do to make our make whistleblower protection laws uh, more favorable to national security employees. I'll just note that in those uh, circumstances where an employee is so upset about what's happening, feels this ethical or moral responsibility, as you say, um, and goes to the public, goes to the media with their concerns, um, knowing that they're not gonna get a good reception internally or, um, uh, or, or what have you. Um, I think there's all, there, there could also be back-end reforms to provide more protection for those people. Um, so it, no US court has ever recognized any kind of public interest defense to unauthorized disclosure of national security information. Um, I think there are ways you could, you could allow people who assume the risk of making an unauthorized disclosure that they feel is necessary um, to try to defend what they did or at least mitigate the, the consequences uh, by making an argument that it was sufficiently in the, in the public interest uh, to do so. Um, so to have judges recognize that kind of, it could be done as a full defense or just as a uh, mitigating factor in sentencing, uh, I think would be a healthy corrective on the back end. Thank you. Just the final word goes to Professor Rodriguez. I apologize for putting you at the end for every question. No problems. Uh, in Brazil, we have no specific legislation regarding uh, whistleblowing, uh, but we have uh, a military justice, uh, a whole system of military justice uh, that uh, should be the responsible for judging these cases. And among scholars is not, um, there, there's, an, there's no agreement if uh, uh, this military justice should exist or not. But I think uh, it reveals uh, a power, it reveals a political power from the armed forces to man maintain it, even if we are not at war. So I, I, I can't, foresee any uh, approval of this type of legislation here in Brazil. And we, we, are, we don't leak that much, uh, at least in national security topics, uh, maybe in, in other bureaucratic topics of the armed forces, there is leak, but not about national security secrecies. So I, I think it lacks uh, jurisdiction, uh, a past, history for me to, to judge, uh, but I don't see it coming, uh, a whistleblowing protection legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you all um, for a great conversation. I think we've addressed several of the main issues in the, in the space of, of secrecy and particularly in national security. Um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.